Good morning again, and thank you all once again for attending the Meeting of the Minds Conference. And I'd like to welcome this illustrious crowd of two, four, six, eight, ten uh, individuals. I'm not going to introduce them. Uh, they will introduce themselves in a minute. When we start, I will actually hand out, um, I brought eight copies of the bio, so you can quickly flip through and get the gory details about everybody. But these are all but two of the contributors to the most recent Advancement Services book. Amy, go ahead and show your, your copy, because I don't have mine here. There it is, Advancement Services Strategies. <coughs> thank, you, that, oh, there, thank you all. Um, it's, th these books are, are, are labors, are labors <laughs> and labors of love. And I, I am indebted to all of these individuals, plus two who, who, who are not able to join us today. And we'll talk about, uh, talk about them, talk about their contributions in a little bit. Um, as Bob mentioned during the introduc introduction, um, this is not a book that I wrote. Uh, this is a book that I, um, uh, helped collect the wisdom of many people. It is the fourth edition. Uh, the other three editions are still out there somewhere. Um, the fourth edition is uh, in print now as of about three or four months ago. And as Bob mentioned, if anyone really, really wants to purchase a copy, we, we brought 20 copies with us. I will pass out the table of contents and the bios uh, for everybody. They're not going to be able to see, we're not going to be able to show a, a, the PowerPoint. So I'm going to flip through this a little bit. Um, and then I'll be turning it over to this crowd. We simply want to talk about the, uh, the world of advancement services and how it has changed. I mentioned it early on um, that it was in the, and I will date myself here. I started working in the field of advancement services uh, at Duke University in 1987, and it was not called Advancement Services. It was really not called anything. Uh, at Duke University, it was called uh, Gift Records. Uh, many other institutions, it was Records Management. Um, but you can imagine back in the olden days, it was basically key punching, uh, putting the gifts into the system, trying to keep track of the individual's on the database and, and that was you know, about it. 1991-ish uh, is, to my knowledge, the first uh, published article by CASE, the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. And for those of you not in higher education, that is who has published all four of these books. Uh, 1991 Case Currents uh, ran an article called Divine Assistance that, that I, I wrote that tried to articulate what is the world of advancement services. Um, that was a long, long time ago. And what we'll be talking about today, is, at the, and I will in a few minutes turn it over to Maureen, who wrote a, a, a chapter in the publication called The Evolution of Advancement Services. So we're going to talk about the evolution of advancement services and how our various chapters and contributions have um, been uh, a part of that evolution. I, I have not checked in with everyone here to make sure that they did, in fact, follow instructions. <clears throat> we'll see if we, number one, finish on time. Number two, everyone is supposed to uh, introduce themselves briefly, who they are, where they're from, um, what their favorite color is, um, and then um, a little haiku that uh, hopefully uh, impresses all of us and talks a little bit about their section. I, as I said, did not um, write the book. I did contribute three chapters, uh, two and a half actually. So I do have a haiku, which I have to read over here that tried to encapsulate the entire book, serving advancement, nurturing relationships, 
engaging donors. Um, that's, that's at the heart of the book. Uh, the book is in, let me see here if I got it right, five sections. Again, I'll pass this out. You can look at the, the handout as people are uh, discussing things. Fundamental issues and challenges, donor relations and stewardship, biographical and gift records, prospect development, and technology in advancement. And we'll talk a little bit about all of those sections uh, throughout the next 45 minutes or so. But without further ado, I'm going to talk, turn it over to Maureen to talk about uh, the advancement services evolution, not revolution, evolution. Maureen? Thank you, John. Um, I appreciate that. I am Maureen Procopio at the University of Oregon. And I am Senior Director of Campaign, and I've been here for 25 years, and this has been my career. I didn't set out to have a career here at the U of O or in Advancement Services, but I think most of us can actually say that we're all accidental Advancement Services professionals, and I love it. Um, my haiku, Advancement Soars, Tax Embrace, Fuels Transformation. Digital fundraising dance. Um, do not grade this, please. That wasn't part of it. I feel bad. Um, I'll start by saying that one of the great resources I had as I started advancement, when I when I kind of graduated from a prospect researcher position many years ago, and then recognized that I wanted to. Uh, grow and expand was using one of the earlier um, editions of the uh, this book. And I, when I was asked to contribute to this, I felt like, whoa, you know, I've arrived. Um, so I feel really great to think that new professionals might be looking at this to grow and and um, and you know learn as as this is an ongoing reference manual. So I hope that you can share this with new and existing um, colleagues. Advancement services is truly at, at the epicenter of changing the worlds um, of our universities and serving uh, what we're trying to do to transform our communities. My chapter was about um, the evolution of advancement services and the recent evolution being a dozen maybe two dozen years, okay? And it's because we're choosing to evolve and not because it happened while we had our backs turned. We're embracing new technologies, um, new organizational structures, and we need to level up in how we approach our work. And we recognize that because we are holding up a mirror and seeing that we need to um, change the approach of our work. And so I did a benchmarking study. It was a part of my work a few years ago to intentionally set out to do studies to look at how organizations, advancement services at organizations in universities are, are set up and changing. So how do we engage our new constituents and how are we looking at them um, to successfully get our alumni to give their time and talent and treasure to us in ways that are going to help us transform our society because we don't want to accidentally or unintentionally achieve that. We need to work effectively and efficiently. And so when I wrote this chapter, it was based on the research I did in 2019, and then we all know what happened after that. So it was really interesting to see the evolution continue in a way that was so unexpected, okay? Um, so my chapter talks about why it was necessary to evolve our advancement services organizations at that point, and then to continue seeing it almost on this water slide of like, oh my God, and we continue where we prepared, are we gonna continue to be prepared? And organizations are becoming completely self-aware. Um, I'm sitting with a whole bunch of colleagues who are going to talk about um, the different ways that the evolution is impacting their areas and their expertise in preparing um, their, their institutions and how uh, the, their chapters are going to prepare you. Um, internal factors for 
evolution um, that I found and, and hopefully uh, could maybe pique your interest. Um, Advancement-wide strategic planning, and that aligns with university-wide strategic planning. Organizational realignments, new leaders come in and say, hey, we need to level up, right? And then also um, probably everything we could relate to, but really big mistakes that happen in institutions. And we need to say, let's hold up a mirror. Let's, let's really um, uh, take a look at how we're doing things and get better. What I found was we need to uh, take a look at where we're investing, the technology we're using, the way we're approaching our work, and the ethics that guide our services are all ways that we're involved in. Aligning our data and technology to benefit our professionals and the different teams is a key outcome of this evolution. And that's what we're going to talk about today and all these colleagues who are on this cube. <laughs> um, and then some highlighted takeaways from the chapter, um, should you want to read my chapter, would be um, close partnerships with leadership and gaining the buy-in and having them walk with you all along your journey. Implementing cross-functional teams, and so not working in silos any longer. And continuing, um, or rather considerations around organizational structures. So uh, if you think about a traditional um, model of our org, org chart, that changes and it's not just um, kind of a flat and then you know spurs off of it but it's almost uh, everybody is working in tandem and partnerships um, so as i wrap up today we're going to hear from these colleagues on their deep dives conversations around biographic and gift records and how they play and interact with technology impacts in the evolution and the importance of donor privacy and um, and how we really need to think about that and consider it and finally, um, we can't forget how donors and stewardship are foundational to all of this. And so we're going to have to hear about the approach to donor relations and how that's evolving. And that's my wrap up. Um, I'm not sure who I'm handing it to, but they probably know. Th thank you, Maureen. Thanks so much. We're going to go now, and uh, as I mentioned, there are five sections to the book, and uh, three sections were authored either solo Lee, solo Lee, or with someone else. And so we're, what we're going to do is combine the other uh, authors from two different sections into what I'm referring to as deep dive number one. I've got six individuals. Let's see, Alan, Amy, Kirsten, Elisa, and Eric, raise your hands. I don't, I don't know if you want to pin them, but um, I, I didn't give them any prompting other than to say, we'll just go in alphabetical order, kind of, sort of. I just put their names in order. Um, but Alan, you're, you're first up. I don't know if I did that by first name or last name, but uh, Alan, go ahead and lead it off, please. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Alan Hanel. I'm the Data Quality Manager at Smithsonian Institution in the Office of Advancement. And uh, I am not a particularly adept poet, but I do want to point out that I was able to steal the first two lines of my haiku from the chapter section headings in my chapter. Um, advancement data, minefield or mostly harmless? Think business purpose. There are a lot of things that uh, I could highlight, but one I think thing that I that occurs to me is it, particularly in terms of evolution, is there's an area that I don't think our, our systems are set up very well to do or our processes, and that has to do with uh, data provenance. So where did we get a particular piece of data and it goes along with permissions often, you know, what do we, what do we, what are we allowed to do with it? So for instance, pretty typical process, someone makes a gift to the Air and Space Society, they provide us a name and email address, we put it in our database, then, you know, years later, they come along and they want to make a gift to the Hirshhorn Museum. So we say, oh, great, name, ad email address. Uh, we find out who that person is. We match up the record. And then we say, oh, great, we already got that email address and we move along. Whereas um, we, what we're not capturing is that we encountered that, that email address again, you know, and so it's not an address that we collected 10 years ago. It's an email address that the person is using you know, last week, and we also collected it in the context of the Hirshhorn Museum. So 
in terms of assessing the quality of our data, the accuracy, the, t the currency of our data, we've lost that data point. And also, we're not quite there yet, but given the uh, European General Data Protection Regulation and its, uh, its definitions of legitimate interest, it may be that we're moving toward the point where we need to be able to show that we have a legitimate interest in having the Hirshhorn be able to commu communicate with that person at that email address. And if we haven't captured that, we'd probably capture it if they make a gift. We've still got some association, but not with that data point. So I think that one of the things we're going to need to look at going forward is making sh being much more robust about not just what the person's email address is, but our history of relationship with that person and that email address and, and data provenance. And I guess I'll just leave that there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan. I Hi. Anne's next. Hi, I'm Anne Kaplan. I'm the Senior Director of the Voluntary Support of Education Survey, the VSE at CASE. And I've been the director of that survey long before I got to CASE when it was at another organization, CAE. Um, so I've been working on this survey since um, the year 2000. And prior to that, I was at Giving USA. I was the writer and researcher for that. And so I worked very closely with um, the organization that had um, the survey because we use survey data back then now now giving USA's relying more on 990s um, so uh, I co-wrote this chapter with uh, Cindy Moon Barna who is um, the head of our library at case and who, who really has been the shepherd of the the standards project and here's my haiku since when does the IRS know what charity is or how to measure it <laughs> and and i think that thank you i think that um in caps it sort of summarizes what i what i find as someone who's managed a survey survey for so long the, to be the major change um in what this the new case reporting standards and that that I don't know if I even mentioned the title of the chapter um, is why the new case global reporting standards matter. They matter for many reasons. I'm sure you're all going to read the chapter. It's great beach reading. Um, and the main thing, though, um, is that instead of following the IRS or the Canadian Tax Authority on what constitutes a charitable gift, um, which doesn't mean you don't have to keep track of that because you do. Um, we pegged um, the definition of uh, charitable gift um, to uh, def a definition of educational philanthropy, which is, ed I'm just gonna read it. Um, educational philanthropy is the voluntary act, has to be voluntary, um, of providing private, private uh, financial support to nonprofit educational institutions to be categorized as philanthropy in keeping with the case standards such financial support must be provided for the sole purpose of benefiting the institution's mission and its social impact without the expressed or implied expectation that the donor will receive anything more than recognition and stewardship as the result of such support and a lot of things flow from that um, that we don't have time to go into in detail that's why um, i'm sure when you get the book, you'll you'll be um, enthralled by all the ways this sort of filters down. But let's not forget, like as advancement professionals um, or advancement service people, we have a, a obligation to the institutions we work for and to the general public to report to the entities we're reporting to according to their rules and regulations and standards. We are um, sort of the the gatekeepers of the truth and the truth to the irs it is different from the truth to, on a case survey you have to know who your audience is um it, it could be that when you're recording a gift you, you're going to record it in different ways for different audiences and, and it's up to us to maintain the integrity of the field so that charitable giving to colleges and universities um it is as above board and transparent as it can possibly be. Uh, we do have a, a battle 
you know, um, our, the reputation of colleges and universities in terms of raising money um, is, you know, plagued with, in, you know, um, fallacies in the public mind. But it, if we can say we as the final arbiters of what constitutes a gift to what audience, how do you count it, how much, um, we we are the, the, the professionals who preserve the integrity of the institutions we represent. And we have, and I know we do, and I applaud the field for, for taking it seriously. Thanks so much, Ann. Amy? Greetings. So my haiku isn't really specific to gifts. It's more of a philosophical uh, twist. I put, knowledge is a rose, which blooms should be ever shared, not left to wither. So a lot of what we do, since there aren't a lot of degree programs that I'm aware of in advancement services, is based on people sharing their knowledge and their experience through formats like this, this particular book. Um, and in terms of gift administration, I, I'm a complete data geek. I love records and gifts. Um, I really feel that that's the foundation, the infra infrastructure, the base, the pyramid, whatever you want to call it or the rest of advancement and what builds from it. What I found fascinating, particularly about my passion as it's come to be for gift administration is that there are regulatory compliance concerns like with the IRS that we have to address. Um, but having those discussions because our donors get so creative in what they wanna to give to us, uh, it becomes about something being philanthropic or charitable is not the same as tax deductible. Uh, they are not one in the same, and it's our responsibility to, within the you know structure of our mission, of course, to accept and recognize and appreciate uh, charitable and philanthropic contributions to our institutions. What comes, uh, what becomes the challenge then is within our relational databases, how to build the codes and structures that enable us to do this on a consistently uh, equal basis that rolls into all of those reports that our fundraisers like to see in their metrics and you know keeps the quality of the data uh, intact um so I, I don't know i just i always enjoyed being part of that putting the pieces of the puzzle together behind the scene um i tell people i joke and say i'm not a fundraiser i don't remember names i don't like to ask for money i don't take rejection well so i can have my fun behind my computer screen and play around in the database all day. Um, but again, when it comes to gifts, the idea of stewardship, as we said, we want to honor donor intent. We want to recognize that they are genuinely trying to support the mission of our organization. So beyond the uh, reminders that um, John gives us on a fairly regular basis about what is or is not IRS tax compliant and Alan to back him up, um, I encourage people to still think outside the box, really consider, again, within our mission parameters, how contributions can benefit the organization and how we genuinely want to recognize and respect that intent and, and roll all of that out. It's not just about, well, sometimes it's just about the total numbers, but you know, it really should be focused on our donors and their inspiration and not just about our implementation and uh, the mechanics of what we do. So I think that, you know, aside from the matching gift sidebar, which I'm a total geek about that stuff too, but um, I don't want to take too much time. So I'm going to leave it at that and enjoy hearing the rest of the comments and ideas from my fellow presenters today. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Next. I think that's me. Um, Oh, good. Then it is. Um, if it wasn't, I'm sorry. I just jumped in line. Um, my name is Kirsten Reppert. Hi, everyone. I'm the Chief Data Officer and AVP of Advancement Operations at Georgetown University. Um, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have co-authored a chapter with Alan on data security. And then um, I authored a chapter on donor agreements. My haiku uh for the donor agreements chapter is a little cheeky but that's just how i am uh donor agreements include the important stuff if you want the cash so um that's that's it in a nutshell there um 
I think, you know, for, for me in, in both of these chapters, and as um, a newcomer, this is, these are my first chapters that, that I've ever contributed on. And like many of you, I thought, oh, I've arrived because I was asked to do something. Um, because for, for many years, I've been in the business for more than 20 years. Um, you know, I'm an accidental uh, advancement services or, or data person as well. I actually got my start in annual giving. So it's really cool to be at the meeting of the minds where we have annual giving um, and advancement services together. Um, I've always just been curious about how things work. Um, and so when it comes to both data security and donor agreements or anything that you are asked to do, your role, um, it can be very easy to get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, did I do the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Have I invested in the right tool? Um, am I prepared for the next disaster? Um, you know, all of these things that, that worry us or someone brings us an exception um, as, I think it was Amy said, as donors get more creative uh, about how they want to give, we're often um, presented with what seems like a nuanced gift or a nuanced scenario. And it can be very easy to think, oh, am I prepared for this? Do I know the answer to this? Um, and as somebody who, in my role, I oversee all of our uh, data and analytics, all of our prospect research, pipeline management, um, gift administration, technical enhancement, security policies, procedures. And I know this, you can't know everything. But relying on your partners, as Maureen had said too, I could not agree more. The industry is evolving and we're evolving as professionals. And so in both of the chapters that I either co-authored or authored, I hope you get a chance to read them. And if you're reading it in a frowning hour where you're not sure if you've done the right thing um, or you're concerned that maybe you're behind the times, the gist is um, just sort of know the core, the fundamentals, and then build from there. Chances are that nuanced gift agreement, that nuanced um, potential security issue, that nuanced tool widget thing that somebody wants because it's going to solve all of your institution's problems. Take a minute, take a beat, reach out to your partners who, who, who know probably better than you, uh, and, and just be guided by that what is, what is the right directional way. Stick to the core, uh, know what your institution does, know who your partners are, um, and you're going to be fine. You're going to be good. Uh, so that's it from me. Thanks, Kirsten. Next. I believe uh, I am next. Hello, my name is Elisa Schomberger. I am a research consultant for Spire Research Group. I am got, actually got my start in um, gift processing, but I have been working in prospect research um, for probably 10 plus years. Um, and I am thrilled I had the opportunity to co-write a chapter with John, um, and the, the chapter uh, is a little bit more, I guess, sort of focusing on a particular issue, which is, what is the IRS beef with donor advised funds and private foundations? And so my haiku, um, donors have options, more time, more peace, less paper, avoid self-dealing <laughs> um it's a little bit more not as cheeky as, as some of the others so uh, but basically the chapter is largely focused on donor advised funds um in terms of we you know we particularly in this field have been hearing a lot about donor advised funds you know there's a lot of controversy a lot of reports and um, discussions about you know what the future may be but this was meant to sort of give a, an introduction to, you know, how, you know, they've been around in some form or other, I think, 1931, but things really changed in um, 2006 when you had sort of your bearers changed um, the formal definition, you started getting more of the uh, um, sponsoring organizations like the, the char uh, Fidelity Charitable, the Vanguard Charitable, etc. Um, and 
the the chapter explores you know why is it that people are electing to use donor advice funds i mean the numbers are coming in um you know extraordinary in the last couple of years and um so looking at exploring it to you know why you know in addition to why are they using donor advice funds why are they not using um family foundations so you know everything from fewer less paperwork less um not having to spend as much money up front to establish a donor advice fund compared to family foundation um you know that potential for anonymity in a way that family foundations don't have uh, just a couple sort of uh aspects but um the chapter second half of the chapter really deals with sort of the recording and you know how to handle uh donor advice fund gifts and family foundation grants with uh pledge payments or not so much um and bifurcated um benefits i don't know john if you want to talk about your part of the chapter i'm happy to summarize no, it that's, you know, you're doing fine they, they can be bored by my presentation tomorrow okay so um basically that you know who can you know who can make a pledge and who can pay it off and you know this this is question of avoiding self dealing by having a you know individual makes the pledge whether they can use their family foundation or their donor advised fund and um it's you know pretty there was some recent movement before it was absolutely it was no with especially with donor advised funds there was a period of questioning this but as it stands um i, I think the answer is probably um uh, the answer is no. Um, I mean, Johnny could probably give a more nuance, but that's a good reason to read the chapter. Uh, but basically, that the uh, um, many of the uh, donor advice funds actually don't allow you to use um, the funds for um, purposes of paying down a pledge. So that kind of nips that in the bud, and then bifurcated payments is you know you can you invite someone who gave ten thousand dollars to through their foundation to your you know your benefit thanking them for those gifts and the answer is no and even trying to sort of find creative ways of getting around that like having the donor make a donation to you know to offset the cost of the meal the answer is still no um so read more for the details um i will pass it on to uh, with Eric, I believe. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, everybody. Um, when I when I look back at um, you know when this book was uh, in its infancy, um, I just want to say that I was honored um, to be asked to participate in this work with a group of colleagues that I've uh, many of whom I've known and admired for years. And it's it's great to sit here today with everybody in in this group. Um, my name is Eric Valdescaro. I am senior director of advancement services at the University of Memphis. I've been in this role for four years. Um, this is my thirtieth year in supporting advancement services, um, and I authored Chapter Eleven: Building a Solid Biographical Record System. And my haiku is i see an address marked preferred with an end date clean up now i see <laughs> thank you so uh so as i said my, my chapter was about uh, building a solid biographical record system i think it's something that speaks to everybody that's in our business um and everything we do and with respect to that uh, and its evolution um i would say that 30 years ago if you had uh, an uh, an accurate um address and phone number for 90 percent of your alumni you were rocking it you're done just go home you're good you know sit back have your favorite beverage um now um today um you need an email address you need the unsubscribes the open rates the click-throughs 
the social media accounts, uh, where alumni work, their job titles, their respective industries, the, the names of their spouses, their children, their parents, if it's a legacy, siblings, other associations, uh, business acquaintances, um, what else? Oh, newsletters they're subscribed to. Um, do they want to get the receipt through paper or email? Um, what events did they attend? Um, did, who, what guests did they bring? Um, try matching up their guests with someone else who's also a, a record in your database. Good luck with that. Um, and it goes on and on. And how, what did they participate at the event? What did they eat? It's, um, I think what's challenging is with the explosion of the internet and the amount of information that's available, um, there's an expectation today that we have to try to capture and acquire all of that information, right? And, and what's happening is that there's a tendency to not have a plan and available resources to just not capture, but also maintain it in perpetuity accurately, right? We can capture it once, but you know how well are we going to continue to keep that updated? Are we going to have mechanisms in place to continue updating that stuff? So um, when I look back at the chapter um, that I authored, I, I wanted to keep it, um, I wanted to appeal to organizations large and small. Um, there are small charities out there that are not going to have these resources, but I could still maybe impart some of my wisdom in what they would need to do to, to, to keep their biographical records um, in good shape. And so I try to keep things at ground level, um, low cost ways to improve their records, um, but also, you know, um, how to make sound choices in data acquisition, data access, data integrity, um, the pros and cons of each each of those options, um, and also you know staffing um, and what it's going to take for regular maintenance. So um, yeah, I hope that if you do buy this book, um, and I think you very well should, because there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge. Um, I welcome you to read my chapter, and I hope you find it of value. Thanks, Eric. Uh, as I mentioned, thanks, thanks to all of you uh, as well. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, a few sections were um, skipped over that one. A few sections were um, mostly orchestrated by one individual, and so we're going to do a deep dive number two with Mark Walcott, who will talk about his section, and then John Thorson who will introduce his section along as, uh, with the colleague who's not with us today. So, Mark? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Walcott. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Technology and Business Intelligence at Emory University in the Division of Advancement and Alumni Engagement. I do feel that in and of itself should be the haiku. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, and I've had the pleasure of working at a number of different institutions. So my view on technology is, um, is, is pretty uh, diverse in that sense. I'm a natural nerd and um, certainly enjoy the chapter I got to write. Um, my haiku, and remember I'm an IT, I'm not, this is not my space I play in, is uh, progress source, universities, future roars, innovation I adore. And that encompasses truly what I feel technology does for university advancement. In writing my chapter, I really gave thought about where we came from. And um, part of that, depending on when you enter technology, we could be talking about index cards for programming. Um, for many of us, we remember green bar paper and uh, what would happen when our printer and our paper went off the tracks, things that happened within our, within our lifetime, social media, email marketing, um, the advancements of online donations, when we consider some of the complexities, I really enjoyed listening to these intros because what um, basically I'm hearing is, Mark, we need to store this data. Where do we store it? In the chapter, I talk about some of the issues and resolutions and guidance along data integrity and management. Um, I love talking about gifts because no matter where you go, the number of dates we have associated with a single gift is mind boggling. You know, whether we're talking about date of record, renewals, 
actual date, payment date, pledge date, receipt date, and then all the ways we, we relabel those things from organization to organization. So I talk about the culture of data integrity and what it means, and especially what it's going to take to sustain that. You know, there's, we're talking about data governance, and that's not just a committee. We are also talking about data architecture and data modeling and design and a whole host of other issues and opportunities to help us kind of get our arms around our data because it's not going to get smaller. It's only going to get bigger and funny enough, we have data making data. So at this point, really having these strong and robust policies that give us the opportunity for growth but also allows us for some control on how this data is reported and managed. Um, I thought really long and hard about how I would even introduce all of these things. And I realized no matter where I've gone or whom I've spoken to, it always comes down to our technological stack. You know, there used to be a time when we were just talking about our CRM. That was it. It was our database of records. Now there's a question of where do our records even sit? And whether we're talking about cloud security, the distributed nature of all the software that we have, um, I just ran through a very brief list, but I'm gonna share it here, an excerpt of some of the things in the book, customer relationship management or, or, or um, constituent relationship management or CRM. We have to have our email and digital, digital communications platforms, our donation platforms. We have an event management, visualization tools, portals, learning management systems, data enrichment tools, constituent analytics and data analytics tools, board management tools, and the list is only growing. So as we talk about some of these things in my chapter, I got scared. I'm going to admit I got really scared. And then I wrote something called um, Advancement 911, when things go wrong. And <laughs> what we need to do to kind of get ourselves back together. So a quick discussion about a COOP, which is a con continuity of operations plan. I do not know where those plans sit for some people, but find it. Make sure that the calling tree's there. What do we do if the internet goes down? Because that's a thing now you know, before people go running out of the doors. And as part of, you know, some of the things I'd wish I put in there, but I didn't get time to do it. And um, I think I'm going to excuse the organization here, but what do we do when we have a data breach? What are the costs associated with cybersecurity insurance and the fact that many people can't afford it? So these are some of the topics that I would love to go back and add, but I'm saying them now as just that continuity of evolution with technology. You know, as we talk about reports, I remember reports used to be things that were truly just tables, printed out, static. We handed them in and that was the end of that. They came out quarterly. Nobody wanted to see it live of the minute, second, and moment that anything happened, but here we are. And when we talk about reading these reports, we have, we, we have to remember the story. And I talk about that in the chapter, about telling the story. What is it that we actually want to communicate? What actions or insights do we really want to give? And that was something that was, again, goes back to our tech stack in all of the different tools and mechanisms we have for reports a personal uh, grievance of mine is everybody wants to have the reports online. Let's use Tableau, SSRS, Power BI, use any of these tools here. You grab your teams, we get all the data there, and it's this miraculous report where you're drilling through and all of the things are right there in your fingertips. And then at the end of the day, they just want to print it. Just, hey, can you just print that for me? That's all I really need. And you spent countless hours getting this stuff done. So, you know, one of my, as I've been able to kind of shift the narrative, you're going to the system and you're going to look at this report online, unless of course you're giving a presentation because all your questions are right there. Because we took into account the story. Technology 
and I and I've been told to to say brief, as you can tell, I can be a little verbose. Where are we going? You know, it, it's it's truly a it, it's it's a miraculous space. I love technology for this fact. So much has changed in the past 20, 40 years. It's even hard to imagine where we'll be. And some of the things that are going to be increasingly important are the types of jobs and skill sets that we're recruiting for. You know, some of the things that you see now that have come about are people that focus on um, SEO. So that's, you know, your search engine optimization, putting in keywords and so on and so forth. Who knew that would be a job 30 years ago? Yet here we are in 20 or 30 years. I fully anticipate seeing jobs that are focused on prompts and intents and how we engage these AIs and how we're using AI to more quickly create these personalized journeys and, per, and re adopting to the personas of our constituents on these online platforms. While um, COVID, that whole era did really send us soaring to the moon on virtual events and augment, augmented reality experiences, they're still gonna be here. And how they're leveraged is going to be critical, especially when we consider some of the opportunities in presentation, donor impact opportunities, and all the types of tours and ways we can make the gap between people much smaller. Love the idea of how data analytics is going to play. The Internet of Things is going to be something I really feel is going to help us understand the behaviors of our donors. And then, of course, we are in the midst. And I don't know how this is going to tilt, but our virtual currencies and our digital assets, how those get passed around. And the chapter that I wrote really focuses and goes into depth on a lot of these topics from the modeling to the data management, the job roles, all the committees, we love committees. And then most importantly, where are we going and preparing yourself for that journey because technology as for those who may have been walking in when we were having a small chat earlier is only gonna become more robust in practice in ways we don't anticipate. And maybe one day we'll be walking into a holodeck to show what the impact would be of a gift and what the building would look like and what that experience would be. So my chapter is lovingly written by someone who enjoys technology and the evolution and the history within advancement. Thanks so much, Mark. Pleasure. Mr. Thorson. Mr. Taylor, um, and, I'm John Thorson. I recently home. welcome home, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I recently retired after 35 years in advancement services with various organizations. I had the pleasure of working with my friend and colleague Lindsay Nadeau from UNICEF USA on the prospect development chapter of the advancement services strategies guide. Um, our chapter covers topics like prospect development cycle relationship management principles, gift officer metrics, and reports. But the very first section of the chapter deals with ethics and donor privacy. And as you've heard from my other colleagues today, our profession continues to evolve at an ever-increasing pace, placing more and more information at our literal fingertips. Um, when I began in prospect research in the 1980s, we would consider anything we could find about a pr uh, prospective donor to be a victory. Then this thing called the internet happened, um, and with it a whole new paradigm to finding information. Today, it actually takes us longer to find nothing than it does to find something. And this means that we make constant decisions about information to exclude from our reports. And I think there are two really important implications of this evolved reality. Number one, we need to focus on the information that matters. In the book, Lindsay and I mentioned separating the interesting from the important. This means tracking down the data that will advance the relationship between our organizations and our supporters. It also requires a deep understanding of the work of our frontline partners so that we can provide the information that's going to make a difference when they're interacting with those supporters. 
Number two, we need to place primary importance on protecting our supporters' rights to privacy. In the book, we discuss the importance of developing an internal ethics and confidentiality statement. We also walk through the steps needed to make such a statement a core part of our organizational ethos. And that doesn't just mean across advancement, but with other parts of the organization that work with us and work with donor data. And that's an increasing number. And of course, we review the importance of working with our frontline partners on all of this. So exploring the key role that research and relationship management professionals bring to protecting donor data brings me to this haiku. Research and RM, crucial advancement partners. Back office, a myth. Thanks everyone. Now back to Mr. Taylor. Thank you so much, John. Uh, the, the one other individual who was not able to join us but wrote an entire section, you probably know and love her, is Lynn Wester, uh, the donor relations guru. Uh, she wrote uh, five chapters, I think it is. She touched on her favorites, the four pillars of donor relations and stewardship, um, uh, stewardship acknowledgement, recognition, and engagement. She also talked about donor relations for retention. Um, so I'm sorry she was not able to join us, but now you have heard from or about everybody but one, and we will wrap things up with my best friend, Gail Ferris, who will talk to us a little bit about how this book can be used as a reference guide going forward. Gail? Thanks, John. Good morning to all of you out in Chicago land there. I hope the meeting of the minds is everything this year that it is every year. Totally informative and a great, wonderful networking experience. Uh, I cut my teeth in advancement services in 1986 as director of alumni records at Yale University. Migrated down in the 1990s to Washington, D.C., and I am in the midst of a second stint at George Washington University, now totaling about 18 years there, but have had a wonderful career in advancement services and have others have said, whoever thought we would be doing this? I certainly didn't. Uh, my haiku for today, I want to share with you just in terms of how we end this analysis of the book. Our story ended. Now we begin the journey. It's fire lights our way. So. I want to make sure that this book can be something that actually lights your way in your profession, that it makes a difference in how you do business. One of the things I think to start with is what is not this book. Those of you who have been involved over the years and looking at the series of books that John has edited for Case over the years, which we affectionately know as the Bruised series because it's black and blue, it could come out at any point there. So uh, that was really the predecessor to what Ann and the staff at Case now have done in the global reporting standards. That takes a lot of the technical stuff out there. And what was always wanting in that was the strategic side, really building that, how our profession works, rather than reciting the rules, which Case has covered so well in other ways. So what do you do with this book? I think the first thing is you take it, taking a look at the title, it's Advancement Services Strategies, and it's a reference for us as advancement services professionals. We're looking at the 10,000 foot level on the one hand. On the other hand, there are some wonderful tactics in there, as some of the other speakers have pointed out. So realize this book is a reference. It can help you either at that high level or at the more tactical level there. So I think it's great for that. The other thing that I think it's really good for is for new staff. And all of us at some point were not in advancement services. And you got here and you kind of wondered what the heck you were doing. I think that this book is a wonderful opportunity to step back and say, okay, what is it that we do? What is the breadth of what we do? And a lot of the people that are going to be reading this book are going to have rather narrow focuses, perhaps. They may not be managers of entire operations of advancement services. How we interact with our other colleagues who are providing services and other colleagues in advancement is critical. And I think that's one of the things that this book really helps you to get a handle on. So I think realize that, yes, how you work with your colleagues, how we work at our institutions to achieve what we've got in mind. So 
I didn't want to belabor mine and have it go on too long as I'm down on our last two minutes on this. But how do you really use the book? Well, the way you don't use the book is it never sits on your bookshelf. This book should never be shelved. The greatest coffee table book of all time. I mean, your vice president comes in and sees it there. They really think you know what you're doing. So yeah, have it out there, ready to go. The other thing is it sits on your coffee table there is it shouldn't sit there all the time. I mean, my copy, when it's not sitting on the table in my office, is being lent out to a half a dozen other staff within the office who are using it as a reference for particular questions. So the book never has to be dusted by the cleaning staff. It's always being moved around. It's got a constantly evolving audience in the office, and people know where to find it. People know how to reference it. They do the same with the global reporting standards. You get that there, but that is what really enables us as advancement services professionals to up our game, to make sure that we're keeping up on the current trends, that we are instituting best practices at our institutions. So I would say, keep that in mind, get the book, keep it out right beside Anne's global reporting standards on the table and make sure they walk in and out of your office all the time. John, thanks so much for the opportunity for all of us being able to be part of the book. It's always a pleasure with the various publications. And thanks to Case for making the book possible. And thanks to Meeting of the Minds for gathering us all together today. Well, and, and thank all of you. You may not be able to hear the applause, but uh, again, it, it was a labor of love for all of us. Uh, we actually began the book uh, before um, March of 2020. So we had to take a little bit of break, um, but then we, we stuck it, stuck through with it. So I thank all of you for sticking through. And with that, I'll let you all go. If anybody has any specific questions for any of the authors, just let me know and I'll be in touch with them. And we'll see you across the way in an hour and a half. Thank you so much.